my first year doing Yak Year, I actually moved to a very not-so-nice neighborhood. My friends used to tease me that that's where the criminals live. And I would tell them, yeah, but they go to your neighborhood to steal stuff. So that's how it started. I look at the little things and make great things out of them. And I said this before, stuff happens, you fix that stuff, and then more stuff happens. Yeah, well, my office is on the street. So okay, gotcha. Not on the street, literally, but, you know. So you live on the street? Yes, I'm a homeless person now. So <laughs> that's, that's a good one of the benefits of owning your own business. Right. I got gotcha. you. Well, if it's all right with you, let's go ahead and just jump right in. Why don't you introduce us to who you are and what you do? Well, my name is Bill Bragman. Yak Gear is a 11 year old kayak accessory company. And as the name sounds, we do kayak gear mostly. However, we have recently in the last 18 months gone into other paddle sport venues, paddle boards, whether they be hard boards or inflatables. And actually over the last six months, we are starting to do marine products as well. And uh, where do you live? I live in Houston, Texas, or our offices are in Houston, Texas, but I live about 40 miles north, wonderful little community called Magnolia. How long ago did you start the business? We started the business in December of 2006. It was just as a hobby. However, it has gone well past that hobby stage. What inspired you? Why do you want to start your own business? A couple of reasons. Number one, my son and I were boat people and we used to fish out of boats. We happened to be down on the Texas coast in our boat. A guy comes paddling by on a kayak, gets into an area that we cannot get into. We watch him catch two fish literally within about 10, 15 minutes. And I turned to my son and I go, how much gas do you think he used? We just looked at the long and short of it. We came home and two weeks later, I sold the boat. And about three weeks after that, we bought two kayaks. As paddle sports has proven, whether you're fishing out of a kayak, it's also a great way for families to get together. And that started that inspiration. Me being a DIY do-it-yourselfer, I kept looking online at what other people were doing to their kayaks. And you always want to live up to the Joneses. So I went ahead and started trying to... Sorry about that. Okay, yeah. Go ahead again. You're talking about being a do-it-yourselfer. Being a do-it-yourselfer, what we ended up... That would be better. We found parts, but we couldn't find the right hardware. Then we'd have to go online and find you know, how to install it. I, the first time out, I lost two fishing poles. My paddle got away from me. I had to go running after my paddle, actually paddling after my paddle using my hands. So I created a, not the first one in the market, but I made a very simple paddle leash. I also made a very simple fishing pole leash. My son and I were fishing in tournaments and a couple of the guys were looking at my leash and they said, man, that's just simple and practical. Can you make me a couple? Sure. Why not? My wife and I were, at the time were selling on eBay and I said, let's try this. So I put 10 paddle leashes on eBay and sold them in two days. Fishing pole leash, same thing. The next thing you know, we're making 20, 25 paddle leashes and fishing pole leashes a night. I incorporated my son and his best friend to help me. We started doing it that way. I had the thoughts that because I had a hard time finding the right accessory with the right hardware and the right instructions, that it may make sense to put it all together. At that time, I was running car dealerships. So to step back and to do this was a hobby. Very quickly, it became a business. You were actually working at it. What were you doing before? You were talking about car dealership. What specifically? So I was running the service department at dealership here in Houston. You started doing this on the side, it sounds like. And then how much money were you bringing in? From the yak year part of this, probably about, you know, $1,000 a month, $800 a month. During the summer, you know, our first summer when we started this, probably $1,800 a month. So it was a nice little nest egg, or it was our fishing money, or in the car business, they say WDK, and that means wife don't know money. So that was just pocket chain. But what happened was, is we had a local kayak shop who saw my leashes, said, hey, would you sell us your leashes? I'm like, sure. I said, by the way, I have some other products. So started putting all the little accessories together with the right hardware, made up my own instructions. A young lady in the marketing department at the dealership helped me make a logo. I took quart Ziploc baggies and threw all this stuff in there, put header cards on them, shipped my first order, and away we go. Where are you at today as far as sales and employees? And so we are going to hit over $4 million in business. We've been growing the last few years at roughly about 20% a year. From myself and my son and his best friend, we now have 16 full-time employees. It just... We're looking at forecasts for next year, and there's no reason not to think we won't do another 20%. When you were growing up, did you always think you're going to be an entrepreneur? I was the guy on the corner doing the lemonade stand. I was the kid growing up in New York that I went door to door to shovel 
sidewalks in the winter. I took my little push mower, did myself and two neighbors every week just to make enough money for snacks, playing stickball. Not many people may know what that is. But I always had that bug in me to do it myself, create a little business, make a little more money. That's really where it all started. During that time, were there any, I guess, between when you were a child and going door to door? And was there any other entrepreneurial experiences between that and Yak Gear? Oh, absolutely. I lived in New Orleans for going on 17 years. I happened to be in Atlanta one time. I saw that they had rotating billboards. In Houston, I had passed through. They had a building that had a projector saying office space for lease. So I sort of put the two together. I started a business called Night Images, N-I-T-E, Images. We actually projected slides onto a wall on the corner of Clearview and I-10 in Metairie, Louisiana. We could do roughly 86 slides in a carousel. We built this system to hoist the projector up every single night, roughly about seven o'clock, went off at five o'clock in the morning. We were so nervous about putting a projector, a $6,000 projector up in the air that one of us slept out with the equipment. There was three of us that were involved. We slept out with the equipment every night. They started to build a building right in front of the building we were at. So we were looking for different sites. When two of the walls were up, there was a big storm that came through and the cinder blocks destroyed all of our equipment. Night images basically went away within the next two to three weeks. Within the night? Yeah, pretty much that night we were done. And over. There was a pun intended there. Yeah. Another thing that I tried to do, there used to be a New Orleans Saints player called Ronaldo Turnbull. He was a linebacker for the New Orleans Saints back in the early 90s. A friend knew him in his rookie season. He had like seven sacks in the preseason. So we started a t-shirt company called Bull Rush. It was a picture of Ronaldo with his number, and it said Ronaldo Turnbull, and it said Bull Rush. And we were supposed to be donating monies to charities. Even though Ronaldo agreed to it at the time, he didn't support it that much. We sold probably about 5,000 t-shirts standing out in front of the Louisiana Superdome. But we did that for about the first six games of that season. And we decided that there had to be an easier way than standing out. So that company went away. But once again, it was another startup company that I tried. Could you tell us what you learned from those experiences? And um, also, I hear a lot of background noise. Is it possible? Is the door open that you might be able to close? That, that's or? actually my dog mm -hmm. who comes to work with me every day. But what did I learn? Yeah, through all those different types of experiences before we jump back into where you're at today. I think in some ways that each one was a learning experience. With night images, it was, okay, look at everything that could possibly go wrong before you start spending to us back then, eight to $10,000 to pull this off. With the t-shirt company, basically rely on yourself. Don't rely on others. And in saying that, that has really prevailed in starting Yak Gear. And the first two years, basically, I was doing it all myself. You know, I went out, got the orders, came home, did the packaging, shipped the orders. I did it all myself. Once those kinks were worked out and we started picking up bigger accounts, I slowly brought in people that were like-minded. People that understood that workday may be eight hours, today be maybe nine hours and 15 minutes. I also, with Yak Gear, have learned to surround ourselves with people who know the paddle sport industry and participate in the paddle sport industry. And actually, 14 out of the 17 employees do that. Jumping back into Yak Gear when you started it, can you tell us when you were doing it, those extra hours, were you doing those after work? Can you tell us about what you were learning in the beginning there? Well, when I first started the selling on eBay, so to speak, we, I was going to work every single day, get off at five o'clock, come home, look at all the orders we had received, start making the products, packaging the products. Before I went to work the next day, I could take all those products to the post office. Really for me, come home at six o'clock, eat dinner, start working at seven, one, one thirty in the morning, I'm done, up at seven to the post office, back to work at eight o'clock. Other than six hours a day, uh, it was pretty hectic. And even though my job was Monday through Friday, this continued Saturdays and Sundays if I wanted to stay ahead of the game. One of the biggest things that, that I do with Yak Gear and, and I really relay onto my employees is that what we truly sell is customer service. So even back then, if somebody emailed me off of eBay or off our website, I respond to those really quickly. In some cases, it may be minutes. 
Most of the time, it's never more than an hour or two. If someone calls to the Yak Gear phone number now, I answer a lot of the product questions. Not only am I sure that it gets done, even though we have three other people that can also get it if I'm not available, but in talking with customers, they have new and different problems, and it may give me a little foresight into a new product that's coming out. But going back to then, in 2006, I landed a big box account. We happened to be at a tournament. The buyer who was sponsoring for the big box was at the tournament weigh-in. He walked up to my kayak and he said, wow, where'd you get all this stuff? And I looked at him and I said, well, I make this. He goes, I'd love to see your products. Here's my business card. Two weeks later, I went and showed him nine products, mm-hmm. which were some of the little kits that we did, plus the leashes. And he told me, can you supply 115 stores with all these products? And I said, absolutely. And he said, we would like to have these in the stores February 15th. And this was probably November 15th. I gave my notice for the end of the year. Yak Gear, as a company where I was the employer, employee, and sole proprietor started in January of 2007. And I filled that first order. Was it scary? Scary may not be the real word. It was exciting. Between myself and my son and and his best friend, to fill an order like that, all of a sudden we had to make 1,800 leashes, 1,800 kits, and there was nine products. So when you look at the total, it's over 15,000 products. We're working minimally 16-hour days. I'm also trying to learn all the rules and regulations to ship to these big box stores. So it's not only developing a product, but before I could even talk with him, I had to figure out what I could truly make the product for. What do I need to wholesale it for? What should the retail be? And so you're doing market research. It became totally encompassing. So it's It's not just thinking of a product and packaging a product. It's really doing everything that people a lot of times don't realize. Oh, by the way, how do I put a UPC on a product? So rather than sit there and and buy the labels, I had to spend $1,800 on a machine to print the labels onto the cards. I had to create item numbers. It was exciting, scary, fun, but it was really pleasing. I think the little details like that that you can describe, is there, is there anything else like the UPC thing? I would never have thought of that. I guess did you not at the time either. And then you're like, shit, then I have to buy a printer or whatever. Oh, yeah. It's because once this big box store, they sent me a form. The big box store sent me a form that I had to fill out. It was the name of the product, the item number, the... UPC number, the description, the wholesale, the retail. And I'm going, "Uh uh-oh, I don't know any of this stuff. God bless Google. But they wanted pictures as well of each and every product so they could put it on their website. Up and above an $1,800 printer, now I'm buying a $700 camera and a small little camera box to take photos. And I take photos out on the water. There's a ton of things There was one article that I read, and I don't remember who authored it, but they talked about for a new entrepreneur, when you're selling your product, think about Mm -hmm. the price you want to charge 10 years from now. So will that price accommodate your expansion? Will that price accommodate you all of a sudden working from home to having an office space? Will that price allow you the growth that you need to bring other products into the marketplace? Or... Are you doing it just as a hobby? I had made that decision when I quit my job that it wasn't a hobby anymore. This is where I wanted to, quote unquote, paddle. This is a river I wanted to paddle down, see where it took me. When you're talking about 10 years from now, are you thinking, what exactly does that mean? Well, in in talking with a lot of people who are inventors who decide that they would like to start a business and such like that, a lot of times they look at, I am going to pay $10 for a product. I am going to charge $20 $20 for a product, I'm going to retail that product for $39.99. Well, that's great. That's assuming that you are making the product forever. You are packaging the product forever. You will never take this business out of your home. Oh, by the way, if you deal with most companies, they will want a $2 million liability insurance policy. All the little things that come off your profit and loss statement, you don't have that on day one, but you definitely have that on year 11. So you should be charging that amount right now, you're saying, of what you Correct. think? Yeah, we. I try to work a lot of times with product developers and such. They'll tell me that they have a great product, they've built a website for it, and this is what they're selling it for. They'll come to me and they'll want us as a company to distribute that product. They're retailing the product for $30. There's something called a keystone markup, which is 50%. So they're charging $15 for the product. And I'll tell them, well, for me to get involved with my company, that we need to be making 
X margin, 30%, let's say. They'll go, oh, I can't do that. That's my profit. Well, you need to think of that. Are you going to be taking the product out to the marketplace? Or are you going to be using another company to take your product to the marketplace? But you as the inventor and owner, you still want to make your profits. So that $10 cost, which he was selling for $15 and retailing for $30, in reality, that $10 cost should probably have been wholesaled for $30 and then retail is $59. And then he could sell it to a bigger company to distribute or market or whatever for 20. And now he's making his profit. And in some cases, not having to do anything. I was going to say, yeah, I think you're giving us a lot of good nuggets of information. And you even brought up the 2 million insurance liability. Can you tell us some more, like I said, getting started, those little things that you didn't know at first? As I mentioned, we used to do all of our packaging on a home printer. So I would get 110 pound cardstock. I would run hundreds and hundreds of sheet through these. It was like, hey, this is great. Then I would buy, at first, I just was doing quart Ziplocs from the grocery store. Very mm -hmm. shortly, I learned, okay, I can't sit here and watch this printer because it keeps jamming and such like that. So now I have to go to a print company. And even though I can tell you that the paper is cheaper, the print company is going to charge you more. But what is your labor worth? In trying to figure out product costs, don't short yourself as far as what you are worth to the success of your product. If I figure out the price of a product now and... I try to include myself in at $250 an hour. But even if I only spend 10 minutes short term, but once again, you go back to how do I offset the UPC printing printer if I'm going to have multitudes of products. Now I need a inventory system that will help me know where the products are and how many of them do I have made? How many of them do I need to ship out? A wonderful thing with a lot of retailers now is something called EDI, electronic distribution information. So you get an email from a third party that the big box store or retailer has entered their order into. That order comes to you. You complete the order. You fill out something called an advanced ship notice, you then create labels on your UPS or FedEx printer, which is, oh, oh, by the way, that's a separate machine. Then you have to put those labels in the right place. The EDI, even though you're doing it as a favor to the retailer, that's going to run you $2,000 a month, $500 a month if you're smaller. Then, as I mentioned, the liability insurance. How long are you willing to give up your home to your business if you're a product-oriented company? How long do you tell your wife that she could no longer park in the garage? You know, it's all of a sudden, you go, okay, I'm going to get a small warehouse and pay $600 a month. Well, did you ever think about that when you were originally pricing your product? I think that's important. Well, can you tell us about that? Let's say the, the slow expansion of the company, you moving out, I guess all those hours that you're putting in early on, I guess with your child and his good friend, can you tell us what your wife thought about that? My wife and I actually split up. Coming from the automobile business and making a very good living, my first year doing Yak Year, my uh, uh, tax return was at $11,000. In saying that, I actually moved out of a very nice neighborhood in the Houston area to a very not so nice neighborhood, but it was $375, all bills paid, furnished apartment in a not so good neighborhood. My friends used to tease me that that's where the, the criminals live. And I would tell them, yeah, but they go to your neighborhood to steal stuff. So that's how it started. When we sold the house through our separation, I got that apartment. Now I needed a place to work. So I got a $475 a month little warehouse that was about 700 square feet. My son and his best friend took off to go to college. So it was Bill. I would get in my truck and drive down to South Texas and stop at every paddle sports store and try to sell them product. I had some of it in my truck, then go back. And if I didn't have what they wanted, I would actually make it and ship it. And I would take off and head to Florida, do the same thing, head up to Tennessee and do the same thing and just kept doing that. I finally realized because while I'm adding all these products on to eBay and now I've designed a website, who's shipping this stuff when I'm gone? So within about four months of moving into my own little warehouse, I now hired a part-time employee to come on and she was my shipping manager and she would pull all the orders. Then her son needed a job. So I brought her son in. He was making all the stuff. So little things with us is Yak Gear as a company now has about 250 products. Over a hundred of them are made in-house. Do you make one at a time or do you make 240 at a time? All of that started back way back then. Don't make one. Let's get in it. And back then it was much smaller quantities, but all right, let's make a hundred of these and then we'll have them sitting in boxes. And if we have to ship them to stores or ship them to eBay or ship them to our website, now you have a quantity of it. Oh, by the way, every time it gets down to 12, let's get back to a hundred. And how did you figure out that method? 
school of hard knocks. Me as a business owner, I had to figure out what worked best for us. Before I was in the automobile business, I was in the shoe business with a company named Bass Shoe Company out of Maine. They had what they called an auto replenishment system. So basically what that does is, is if you have 12 pairs of shoes sitting on display and you get down to four, they send you eight more pairs of shoes in the correct sizes. And this was early on in computers back in the 80s. I realized that we could never be out of anything for more than a day because what I had going for me more than any other company is that customer service of while I'm on the road, call me on my phone, I'll pull off, I'll take an order, I'll answer a question. And then when I would get to where I was stopping, I would call back to the office. We were doing orders on three by five and five by seven index cards. And we were keeping those. That once the order was filled, it went into the shipping box. And from the shipping box, it went into the accounts payable box or accounts receivable box. It's now we have QuickBooks Pro. We have a full blown inventory system. Oh, yeah. You have to pay for those things, too. So when you first start your business, think about 10 years from now and all the costs that are going to go into running money. Want to be that guy that knows how to throw real parties? Well, now you can with Soundbox. It's the world's loudest portable speaker. It's built like a tank and has 40 hours of playing time on one single charge. So go ahead and be that guy. You know, the party guy. You earned it. Check out Soundbox, that's B-O-K-S, for more information on the world's best party speaker. Oh, and don't forget to check out episode 23, where I interview actually one of the co-founders of Soundbox. We talked about it in the pre-interview, but what motivated you to keep this business going? Was there something your wife said to you at some point? On, on a funny note, when my wife decided to move from Houston, she looked at me and she said, you will fail at this too. That was enough to let me know that anything I had to do to pull this off, I was going to do. Luckily, after the first year, I could tell that this was going to work. I never thought it would work to this extent. But about the fifth year of Yak Year, my son and his best friend had graduated college. We had talked about them coming to work. They asked me, is this going to be a small little mom and pop shop or are we going to build this? And mm -hmm. I said, we're going to build this. One of the best things that ever happened was bringing in them because what they allowed me to do was to focus on really what I do best. And that's product development and sales. My son took over the accounting and he at 22 years old became the CFO of Yak Year. His friend Mark became the marketing director for Yak Year. And that's really, the two of them, really with the work that they put in, really allowed me to focus on sales, product development. To be honest, when they graduated college, they knew everything about how to run a small business. Mm -hmm. Absolutely everything. And if you ask them now, they'll tell you they knew absolutely nothing. But there's a sense of pride that everybody has from going to college and all that it takes to finish college and everything that you've learned. However, when it comes to running a business, you need to take a step back and you need to talk to people who have started, completed, started their own business and really the trials and pitfalls that they went through. Have they told you what the things that they thought they knew and now looking back, what they realize they didn't know? <laughs> Well, you know, in, in the whole world of accounting, which was something my son said, is it's debits and credits. It's where does this go into this file and where should this go into this file? Not the actual accounting system that you need to use to best suit your needs. He does 99% of the ordering for all of our company. We're well past that index card stage. So we've actually worked with a company named Fishbowl. We pay thousands to use that fishbowl system so that we know we get bulk product in. That bulk product now goes into the production room. The production room now takes a lot of different bulk product and packaging and puts it all together. And now it goes back on our shelf as a completed product. And it's not in the place that you took the bulk product from. That experience is not something you typically learn in college. You learn it by trial and error and you learn it by reading. So that's changed. Mark graduated with an accounting degree as well, but we really needed him to quote unquote run production and do the marketing. He quickly delved into that marketing between social media and working with magazines, working with online, whether it's you know paper or online magazines. And he learned enough that he actually left us last year to travel the United States, and he's actually traveled internationally, writing articles for outdoor publications. It's not what he graduated college for. 
What's been some of the hardest parts about doing this company that you did not foresee? I guess how to handle growth and also working with my son and his friend, Mark. And my son's name is Miles. I thought it would be a natural for them to come in and help me and work with me and such like that. But that was a really rough period for the first year or two years. However, I look back upon myself knowing what a smart ass I was at the same age. I knew everything when I first started managing shoe stores for people. I knew that that would change. And now we have a great relationship. Absolutely amazing. But that was really hard. The input I got from outside people is if you want your kids to come work with you, make them go work somewhere else for three, four years, and then have them come begging and crawling to work for you. As I mentioned, the growth. Initially, the what I really, really loved doing, as I mentioned, was sales and the product development. Now, however, as we've grown, I've gotten back into that. I'm the CEO. I'm the president of the company. I have to look at a lot of different things than I ever thought. When I first started and I needed to buy bungee or rope, I would get on the phone with a company and say, what's your price? And they would say, well, a roll, you know, 500 foot roll is this. And I'd go, what if I bought six roll? What would deal would you give me then? And, you know, I'd hear snickering on the other side of the line, like six, that's no different than one. Well, now I'm negotiating a thousand rolls of rope every month. And I have to continuously keep doing that to making sure that we get the best possible price so that we continue to offer the best possible price to whether it's our retail customer or our vendors. Can't let the natural progression of things, oh yeah, we had a 3% increase this year. You lose 3% off your profits, it's like you had a 20% decrease in sales. At some point, was that creeping up? Did you have an issue where you weren't watching that at some point? Well, I didn't really, first two or three years when I was doing it all on my own, I really didn't worry about it as much. I actually, I priced my products originally where I said, hey, it'll never be a problem. Well, by year three, it was a problem. You know, we made a very, very small profit our first year. And I mean, small, like $4,000. Second year, I think we did $12,000 in profit. Third year, we lost $28,000. And I was like, wait, I quadrupled my business from the first year, but I'm losing money. This doesn't make sense. Well, once again, it goes into those expenses of, okay, fine. You have a warehouse. You have this printing machine that you're amateurizing off. Oh, by the way, I just put 140,000 miles on my truck and I need a new truck. Well, it's a company truck. So now I'm going to put the company truck against the company. Company, that's money off every month. So that foresight of where am I going to be in 10 years, it keeps raising its ugly head. You know, as an entrepreneur, I always tease people that you need to go to the circus. You need to stare into the center ring when the guy comes out and he's got seven sticks and seven plates. Watch him spin those plates. None of them can fall. As a business owner, that's who you are. Now, I'm probably not in the center ring spitting those plates, but now I'm the ring master. I'm worrying about the entire circus. But when I'm not in the ring and I'm going in the back, I'm still spitting the plates, but not you as good. You had much. mentioned something about you thought the easiest part is actually making the product. And could you talk a little bit more about those seven plates? Yeah, well, the easiest part is developing a product because you can look out. If you have an idea for a product, you can look in the industry with the wonderful Internet and go, hey, nobody makes that. So I'm going to make this product. Plate number two becomes how am I going to make this product? What do I have to do to develop the product? What do I have to do to get prototypes of this product? Where do I go that route? Okay, now that's accomplished. Number three, now you have to send and go talk to companies who can manufacture your product. Find those resources. Plate number three basically is, okay, now you need four 3D renderings of a hard product or enough prototypes of your product to give to enough people to get competitive bids. The next plate becomes, what am I going to do to this product to make it retail ready? If it's products like we do, hard products, then you need to come up with packaging. Is the packaging going to hang correctly? How small of a packaging can I do so that the stores that are interested in dollar per square foot sales won't look at me and go, oh, you're taking up too much room. Do we make the product so that it comes already pre-put together? Or can the customer do it on their own with simple instruction? The next step then becoming, okay, where do I find places to sell? Is everything only on website, on the internet? Obviously, you create the largest margins that way. But if you can do $100,000 on a website and it's a good product, you may be able to do a couple of million out in the retail world by having it in stores. So that decision comes up. And then all of a sudden becomes, where am I going to put the product once it's developed? How am I going to pay for the product once it's developed? How am I going to insure the product once it's developed? All of those little things keep going into, wow, I came up with this. And it's like, okay, take this to market.
it's a whole different world. So especially when you start listing those things out, like I said, it seems like, yeah, you just look at a product, hey, I can make a pencil, but you don't go into all the other things of actually running. Well, a no. And, and, and the funny thing is you mentioned a pencil. So I, I will sit there and, and ask you questions of, well, what color do you want the pencil to be? Do you want the pencil to be pre-sharpened in the package or to be dull pointed? Do you want the eraser to be a quarter of an inch long or a half an inch long? What's your edge in the marketplace that your pencil should sell better than the next? I always a lot of things to take to account. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, it, and it's become for me, it's every day now. You know, there's a phrase that I always tell everybody that works for me and that stuff happens. You fix the stuff and then tomorrow stuff happens. Yeah, no, I like that saying. Well, uh, I believe you wanted to mention something else too about the, you know, young people or entrepreneurs who are listening. You mentioned that your time is not your own. Oh, no, absolutely not. You know, with me, I mentioned customer service. You can call Yak Gear. It's not like the phone number is disconnected. However, it will ring to someone 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So the last thing I hear from my wife every night is put your phone on silent. The thought of doing real vacations, I can't unplug. Even if I go on a vacation, I have to spend an hour a day, even no matter how remotely we are, that I can get on a computer and answer emails, get on my phone just in case. We can't really go to uncharted territories where there's no internet service. If there is, I'm taking a boat ride to somewhere where there is internet service. When my wife first met, met me, we went to Turks and Caicos, and we didn't even think about it. And the ho little wonderful little hotel we were staying at had no internet. I'm standing next door, and I paid the resort $20 a day to be able to log into their internet. I'm out by the pool typing on my computer on my laptop and answering phone calls. So... And oh, yeah, phone calls when you're out of the country. They're not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, kind of mentioned some of the hard things. Are there any other harder things that you can or stories that you could bring up that hopefully an entrepreneur could relate to or don't doesn't necessarily think about when they're starting a company? Think of as many or more of the negatives and research. You know, the positives are I get to do it myself. I get to come to work every day in shorts, slaps and a T-shirt that has, you know, my company's name on it. Those are some wonderful positives. The negatives are, is that wheel and those plates start spinning. So am I affecting me? Am I affecting the people around me? Is it positive? Is it negative? As I mentioned, there's a huge excitement with doing this. I have never been a person to sleep more than four or five hours a night. So if you're the type of person that likes to sleep 10 hours a night, you might want to rethink this. People say all the time, oh, it can't be that hard. And I just sort of nod my head and go, you're right. I enjoy watching and, and listening to shows that talk about entrepreneurs. As funny as it seems, watching Shark Tank, watching The Profit, those have given me a lot of great ideas. It's, you know, you listen to Kevin tell people, it's a hobby and you're dead to me. It's true. Is this a hobby or is it a business? And if you're going to do a business, make sure you're doing it the right way and think of all the pitfalls as you're coming along. That doesn't matter though. Aaron, I can tell you straight up front, I can sit there and tell people all day long. People can tell me all day long, but until you step in that hole yourself, it doesn't make sense. Bleeding from that third year to the fourth year of the business, was there any one point or maybe a few points that you can think of that's been a turning point in your business? It sounded like maybe that third to fourth year is finally that you got a hold of the expenses? Has, has there been anything else that's really helped your growth dramatically? For us, I think the biggest part was bringing on someone to handle some of the things that I, I knew I didn't like doing, the accounting portion of it. For me to sit there every night and go, okay, let me send an invoice for this. This check came in and now I got to make the deposit slip and that type of stuff. Is that two hours a day or hour a day? Can I spend it doing something else? The whole marketing, that's something that I see marketing from a consumer's standpoint, but I don't see marketing from a insider's standpoint. Allowing Mark to really get into how to market the company. One of the biggest things that the boys, Miles and Mark, pushed me to do was to stop traveling as much and start going to convention. We actually went to our first convention in year four, and we had a tiny little 10 by 10 booth. I built all of the displays in my garage. We set up with 70 products. It was unbelievable how many people walked into our booth, had interest in our products, and a lot of them were other big box stores, said, I'll take this, 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 and this, and how many do you need? A thousand. Great. It's that work smarter rather than longer. It doesn't totally play out because by working smarter, now we worked longer and we worked bigger. So those being going to conventions in our business, there are a lot of kayak tournaments, which some people go, are you kidding? No, there's a lot of kayak fishing tournaments. There's actually a freshwater bass tournament now that, that pays out $100,000 to the winner. Through 
my son's eyes and Mark's eyes, they said, we need to get involved. So we're actually reaching out and touching people. And all, all that basically is, is handing them some product so that they can give away. But then on the stand, they're going, okay, Yak Gear is now giving a leash or Yak Gear is now giving, you know, on, the, on their new milk crate system. Not only was it going out to actual users, but it was also, they were filming it and putting it on social media and Instagram and all that. So we have thousands and thousands of followers through that social media. Once again, me pulling back from thinking I can do everything to really focusing on the things I do best and bringing in those other people really helped me to grow the company. But once again, how am I going to afford to pay them? That's scary. And how do you keep your passion going during that time? Because I mentioned before, sometimes entrepreneurs lose their passion when they start you know, a company and maybe it comes in and out. Where are you at with that? For me, all it is is someone walking up and saying thank you. I travel the country enough. At this point in time, we have three full-time salespeople, including myself and such like that. We have a full marketing department. We go to shows and it's just really interesting, especially with social media. There was a write-up about me in a newspaper called Maiden Voyage Houston. I wanted to share it with people. The truth is, is that I have not done this alone. Whether it's between the employees that work here or my wife saying, you're doing a great job and I can't see it, but you're doing a great job because you're taking care of our needs. You know, and someone walking up and just saying thank you is all I need because that makes a difference. When I used to be in the automobile business, I used to be a trainer of salespeople. And I would tell them that you have to be a good finder. They would look at me like I was weird. And I'd say, it's really kind of simple. And I still believe in this now is that if you wake up every morning, that's a good thing. If you hop out of bed and don't trip and fall on your face, that's a good thing. If you get into the shower and don't slip, that's a good thing. Your car starts, that's a good thing. You get to work safely, that's a good thing. Your computer starts, that's a good thing. And then the first customer of the day says no. Ah, uh, That's one bad thing, but nine good things. And I've always been taught that the only reason a person says no is because they don't have enough information to say yes. Now, you can't get back in their face, but you can slowly give them more information in a polite, courteous way that helps them make their decision. All of those little factors, I love coming to work. It is exciting. The fact that you emailed me and asked me to do this is exciting. I, I look at the little things and make great things out of them. I said this before, stuff happens, you fix that stuff, and then more stuff happens. Well, thank you for you said, reaching out and sharing your story. Like I said, I, I, I think that helps a lot of people who are listening. But I wanted to go ahead and jump back to you saying, if someone says no, they don't have enough information. Can you tell us about how that is applied in your company, like maybe when you were starting out? I have had a retail background, as I mentioned, in, in, in the shoe business. One of the things that I always learned was, for instance, dollar per square foot. A lot of people don't look at that. If I have a product and a competitor has pretty much the same product, what makes mine better? Well, if I can figure out a way to put it in a smaller package by 15% and still offer same visibility in the storefront, now we can get six more products because mine's a little better sizing, then that's great information for the buyer who's looking at my products because I can tell them that, oh, by the way, my products sell at $165 a square foot. What? The one I have now is only selling at $81 a square foot. That's I said, yep, I know that. That's the kind of information. But you have to find what makes people tick. You just can't be spouting, hey, you need to buy my product because I know it's going to be sunny tomorrow. What does that have to do with anything? Our product has a three-year warranty on it. Everybody else's is one. Okay, that's a benefit. So once again, they may not have all the information because the people you are talking to a lot of times get bombarded so much that the easiest thing for them to say is no. Someone told me that it takes a whole lot more muscles to say yes than no. So we appreciate you coming on, sharing your story. Do you have any maybe last words of wisdom for anyone who's listening? And what's the best way for people to, to say thank you for doing this interview and reach you? My email address is my first initial last name, B Bragman, B B R A G M A N at yakgear.com. Feel free to reach out to me. The last bit of wisdom is something that we always tease about in the kayak business as well. Measure five times, install once. You don't want a hole in your kayak. So appreciate that. So, well, thank you again for coming on and sharing your story. We really appreciate it, Bill. No, my pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you for reaching out, Austin. All right. Thank you. Do you ever wonder how we find the guests to interview on this podcast or what I talk to them about after the call? Well, for this episode with Bill Bragman, we have both the pre-interview and post-interview clips for you. Just take out your iPhone or Android, look at the podcast description for this episode, and there will be a link that directs you to the website. And if you can't figure that out, then just go to millionaire-interviews.com backslash 018 for this episode. And here's just a little preview of the conversation. 
what he truly never learned at school. And we were talking about six months ago, and he goes, I don't know how the hell you did this. And he goes, I didn't need to go to school. I just needed to start working here. <laughs> some people have given me pushback on the name, and I'm like, um, I don't know when millionaire became a negative connotation, but to some people it does. And so it's just like, you know, I think when you're younger, I, I think everyone strives to be that. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you on the website in a few minutes.